Hi everyone, gonna get started here today. Thanks for joining us. Um, hope you can hear me now. We're going to be talking about Structural Screws 101 and code compliance. I'm Judy Milheim with DIY Home Center and we've invited some of our pro contractors and as well as some of our savvy do-it-yourselfers to this webinar. So today I'm excited to introduce Greg Grunhout from Camo Fasteners. Greg has over 30 years of experience in the building industry, and he's here to tell you everything he knows about structural screws. So um, I guess before we get started, let's take care of some just real, real quick housekeeping. Um, we're gonna be recording this webinar for future purposes. Um, during the webinar, if you guys have any questions, just drop them into the chat throughout Greg's presentation. Um, we can answer as many as we can during the Q&A session at the end. Um, if you look on your webinar control panel, you'll see like a, um, a red arrow and that'll expand the, the chat options for you. So go ahead and ask your questions there. Um, lastly, stay with us till the end and you will be eligible to win a $200 DIY Home Center gift card. You have to stay till the end to see that. Um, and then everyone who participates today will receive the DIY Home Center coupon code. Uh, that you can use on structural screws, camo products, or any other products at DIY Home Center. So without further ado, let's turn this thing over to, to Greg today. All right. Thank you, Judy. Appreciate that. Thank you, everybody that's joining out there today. Um, I'm not going to tell you everything I know. Maybe I will. It may not take that long. But uh, I'm going to do an overview for you of, uh, of what we know about structural fasteners, and uh, we'll get into things that you should look for. We'll even get into a little bit about building code, et cetera. Um, and like Judy said, if you think of things during the presentation that you want to ask a question about, just go ahead and throw them in the chat, and we'll cover those uh, later on after I run through the presentation itself. So we'll run, we'll just roll right through here. But so I want to just start out by asking the simple question, what are structural fasteners? So in terms of what we're going to talk about today, when I talk about structural fasteners, I talk about the screws that are being used or the structural fasteners that are being used for those critical connections in the interior and the exterior of your building. Okay, so whether it's a deck, whether it's a home, a pole barn, or a commercial building, uh, there's codes surrounding those critical connections. And so we're going to talk about the fasteners used there in terms of the, the breadth of category that's included in structural fasteners. You're going to run into things in terms of our line. We offer framing screws. We offer ledger specific screws, truss screws for those wall connections. We offer multiply screws and then just general purpose for all those multi-purpose projects out there you know, a full breadth of line of, uh, of structural screws to handle those jobs as well. We're going to kind of hone in a little bit on the code compliant critical connections, but just want you to know when I, when we refer to structural fasteners, it could encompass any of those things. So pretty wide breadth of categories included in structural fasteners. So um, just go to that next slide there. So types of structural fasteners, some of you are going to recognize, obviously, both sides of this slide. On the left, you've kind of got the old school lag screws or maybe a lag screw with a washer. And then throughout history, you've, you know, for, especially for exterior connections, you've used a hot galvanized lag screw, maybe for putting up a ledger board or doing some other type of critical connect connection on a deck and even inside the house or building. And then on the right side, you've got the newer, sexier version. These are what we call the structural screws. So there's a pretty wide variety of product out there. You probably recognize some of the screws that are on the screen today there. You've got the SPACs, uh, there's a GRK screw there, even a Fasten Master screw. Um, and so in terms of structural screws, you know, they're, they're able to be made now uh, with a special, maybe a proprietary coating on them for corrosion resistance. They've got special design features to help with the application of the screws, the driving of the screws, the strength of the screws. They're also hardened steel, unlike a lag screw, which is unhardened, really gets its strength from the, uh, from the size of the screw. Um, but if you take a look at this next slide here, some of the advantages that we want to just talk about real quickly in terms of structural screws versus lag screws, and you're still seeing lag screws used out there. A lot of guys still use the lags for whatever their reasons are. Uh, but I want to tell you about a few advantages if you're not aware of using a structural screw. Uh, on the left, you see the guy with a ratchet in his hand. 
Um, for a lag screw, you've got to pre-drill, and sometimes you've got a double pre-drill before you can put that screw in. Then you then you put the screw in, and you've got to ratchet it into place. So very time-consuming in terms of that. Whereas with a structural screw that you see on the right, uh, you can zip those right in, no pre-drilling, go in with a standard drill, saves you a bunch of time. And so in terms of structural versus lag screws and the advantages, I've got a quick list here for you. Uh, in terms of a lag screw versus structural, lag screws, like I said, are not hardened. They achieve their strength through the size, but that requires pre-drilling to get that product into the material. And they're very slow to install, take more than a minute. Structural screws are actually designed to be a one-to-one -one replacement for those lag screws, even, they're, even though they're smaller. Um, there's no pre-drilling required. Um, they're code compliant, or they should be, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. They only take a few seconds to install, um, and they can be designed for specific applications. So we're not going to get too much into different types of screw design. We will talk today about some, some screw features that you'll see kind of across the board on structural screws. Uh, but they're able to design these screws to really optimize their performance in a given application. So just keep that in mind. So designed for specific applications. And they offer greater strength than a smaller size. So that's just going to save you time and money. So I wanna share with you um, some features and some pretty common features generally of the screw design and performance of the structural screws. So we're gonna take a look, and this happens to be one of our camo screws. And we do some special things with our screw, but you're gonna see some features that are also fairly common in the industry that we're gonna talk about. We're gonna talk about the advantages or why these features are in place on the screw. So I think those are important to know. So let's take a quick look at the, just the nose of the screw or the, the business end of the screw. We'll start at the point. Um, a sharp point is important because it helps you get the, get the screw started quickly, less spinning, uh, a little bit more biting and entering the product. Uh, the, the building material faster is important to the user. Um, and then we also add a slash point. So you'll generally see a slash. We have a double slash on our structural screws. But the sharp point is really what gets the fast start. The slash points are to reduce splitting. So keep that in mind. There's kind of a, some misinformation out there that slash points help a screw start faster. It's really not what they're about. They're really just to help auger some material out uh, and reduce the splitting that that screw might do when it goes into the material. The last thing you want to do, especially in a structural application, is split the material that you're going into. If you're on the exterior of the house, that splitting will, will allow weather moisture to get into that board and degrade the board. If you're inside the house, it could just damage the structural integrity of that building material, and you don't want to do that. So reducing splitting is really important. So let's move up the screw a little bit to the midpoint of the screw, and you see the nice aggressive threads that are designed, and we've got a mention here of TPI. Um, and so that's really re regarding the threads per inch on the screw and also the angle of those threads are important. So you might think that a really fast driving screw would be an advantage with you're driving in these big screws. You want them going fast as possible, right? No, not really. Those threads are integral to the holding power of the fastener. And so although you don't want a super slow driving screw, you want something that's kind of in the middle there where you have a nice drive speed, but you're, but you're maximizing the holding power given by those threads. So a real steep thread angle would give you a fast entry and a fast drive, but would reduce your holding power. So just having a kind of a middle of the road, optimized thread angle and pitch um, will help you with holding power. And so that's one of the things we looked at when we look at how to design our screw. Above the threads, you see this funny looking thing on the shaft. Uh, we call a neural, I think most people call them a neural. But that is there really, once the threads continue into the material and are pulling the screw in, that neural is going to eat away some material because you've got a long shank generally with a structural screw that needs to be dragged through the material before the head reaches its use point, right? So as the threads go in, that neural cleans material, allows the shank of the screw to be dragged through that opening really nice and cleanly without friction. That neural is really gonna reduce the torque for an easier drive. It's gonna take less battery. It's gonna be easier for your, for your driver drill to send that screw in. So just generally reducing torque is the reason that neural is there and allows that shaft to just slide smoothly through the material. All right, let's go up to the head of the screw and take a look at some of the design features in the head um, because this is really important as well. And you see on the screen, we have a flathead screw. 
In our line and in many lines, you'll also find hex heads and hex heads are available in our line. We have a lot of guys that still like the hex head type style. And we also offer hex head because you can apply a hot galvanized coating to that. And that's important for coastal areas. But the industry is really going towards a flathead screw. And that's what you see on the screen there. So we offer a nice oversized flathead screw that gives you a lot of pull down power. And once it's installed, it gives you a lot of holding power uh, for the material that you're, you know, whether it's a ledger board or, or what have you on your deck build or any other kind of project that you have. That flathead's become popular because it sits flush to the material. A hex head will protrude. Even some screws that have flatheads, but they have a bubble on the head, uh, similar to maybe a GRK RSS. Um, those have to be countersunk in order to get them out of the way of other accessories on your deck, such as a joist hanger. Or maybe you're using these on the outside on the rim of your deck and you need to put fascia board over that. The last thing you want is a screw head sticking out and blocking your next application or your finishing application there. So flathead have become all the rage in the industry and most people are using a flathead out there now. So a couple other features in regards to that oversized flathead that we have is we put nibs on the bottom of the head. And why are those nibs there? simply to clear a little area for that flathead to sit flush in the material as it's fully driven. The chamfered neck that you see below, we don't just run uh, the shank of the screw straight into the flathead, we chamfer it there and that increases the size or gives it a neck there so that where you have the recess for your bit that meets the head of the screw and then transfers power to the shank of the screw, you've got a buildup of material there and that really helps the performance of the screw, the last thing you want to have is something weak in that area where you may break the screw. So that really strengthens that interface there. And uh, as we move to the next slide, you'll see the recess better on this next slide. Um, you see the head of the screw there. Um, a six lobe star drive are very popular in the market today. Um, great six points of contact, really engage well, bit to the screw avoids cam outs um, and works tremendously well. So you'll see those in a lot of brands that are that are out there in the field today for you to purchase. But we obviously use that across the board in our line as well. Um, a couple other things in terms of a structural screw or a structural program that you ought to see when you use a structural screw are head markings. And the reason those head markings are there are for, for identifying the screw once it's fully installed in the material. So if you're hanging a ledger board and your building inspector comes by and needs to inspect that you've used the proper fastener and the proper spacing for that installation, he's gonna need to be able to identify the brand and the length of the screw that you used and the coating of the screw. Those things are all generally marked on the heads of structural screws. We certainly do on ours. You see our brand name clearly there. Um, we've got a coating indicator with a slash mark that tells them that's our ProTech Ultra 4 coating. So he can see that that coating is code compliant for exterior use with treated lumber. It also has a number there which signifies the screw length. So he can take a look at that without uninstalling that screw or taking anything out of the material. He can identify the screw, the structural screw to make sure everything's code compliant on that job. Makes his job really easy. They love that, okay? Um, and the other thing that we put on our head that some of the other ones will as well is a marking identifier that'll tell you the thickness of the screw. So everything you would need to identify that screw is on the head of the head of the product there for the inspector to see. So super important. On the next slide, we're going to take a look at something I wanted to mention. There you see the full screw in all its glory. You'll see our flat head and hex head options that are available. So those styles, like I said, are both still available for the market, even though most guys have kind of transitioned to that flat head. <clears throat> but I also want to mention coatings. And I mentioned a hex head with a hot galvanized coating and then our ProTec Ultra 4 coating. So in our line, we do ProTec Ultra 4 across the board, but we offer a, a, a hot galvanized. And why would we do that? It gives you a coastal option. So by the coast or where salt water can have impact, you're gonna to wanna to be using a 316 stainless steel screw or a hot galvanized screw. Those are both code compliant for coastal areas. But let's just talk for a minute about the coatings on the screw. You also wanna make sure if you're choosing a structural screw that you've got a coating on that screw that's code compliant, all right? So there's a minimum that is required for code compliance with a structural screw. And that's AC257, or, or what they'll commonly refer to AC257. 
And that acceptance criteria into code would just tell you that that screw is equivalent or better than hot galvanized for 1,440 hours of exposure, all right? Accelerated exposure, not just, it's not just gonna last 1,440 hours, right, in the outdoors, but this is accelerated testing. Our fastener, and I think something you should look to, and I'll talk to you a little bit about this later, is that that's the minimum required. These are critical connections, and a lot of time, exterior critical connections, where you wanna go above and beyond when in terms of coating. We offer, uh, in the Camel line, a Protec Ultra 4 coating. That's actually double the exposure hours in testing of the AC257, so just keep that in mind. Every screw that you use as a exterior structural screw ought to be AC257 compliant, and they ought to be able to prove it in their code report or exceed that, all right? So just a word on coatings for the structural screws. Um, I've mentioned code a couple of times, so let's just talk about building code. And obviously this is gonna be a little bit uh, uh, brief, but if you have some questions for me in terms of building code and what's needed, uh, put them in the chat. We'll, we'll talk, we can talk about that a little bit later. But why does building code exist? They are not the best building practice necessarily. They are the minimum standard requirements um, established by the International Code Council and then adopted um, by your locality. So minimum standard requirements, that's the least that you're able to use for that particular application where code is involved. And why are they there? They're simply there to ensure public safety, right? So we don't want buildings collapsing, we don't want decks collapsing. And so building codes are developed specifically for that. So let's take a look at the, uh, the group that develops code and that's ICC. So International Code Council is what it sounds like. It's an International Code Council. It's a group of people from around the world. I think there's 35 or 36 countries that have people that sit on the, on the council uh, and they develop the code that is once it's established as ICC code, it can then be ad adopted by your state or local governments, right? And so ICC is really where these requirements come from. And that is just the, the leading global body on building code. And this is a great thing. They establish those safety standards for building. All right, so in terms of what we talk about in our building, in our part of the building industry with structural screws for decks and whatnot, um, it's the IRC and the IBC code books. And these are developed by the International Code Council. It's International Residential Code and International Building Code Books, right? And so what are those two things? And, and do we care about both? Why do we need to? International residential code and international building code aren't just residential and commercial. Some people think of, think of these code books in terms of one, uh, one covers residential because it says residential, right? So that's what it does. And one covers commercial buildings probably. Well, that's not actually the case. And so what we want you to know is international um, residential code covers all building structures three stories and below. Okay, so there's a certain size that are covered under the residential code. And IBC actually covers everything outside of that. So you can have residences or say a multifamily that's more than three stories tall, that's covered by IBC, right? And then you have your commercial properties as well. Uh, but anything that's not covered in IRC is covered by the IBC and, and everything three stories and under uh, dwellings and other uh, out structures are covered by the residential code. So that's just kind of a quick way to look at it. And as I mentioned, ICC develops the code, but that doesn't mean they're law, right? So they have given you the best building standards they can come up with for doing a certain type of application. But that building code is not legally binding until it's formally enacted by your state or local municipality, all right? So then it becomes law. So technically you could follow code, but you really need to check your local building codes to see what is in the code and what is not. And some localities, depending on where they're at, will have more strict rules and regulations about building code, and some will not. So I think general, as a general rule, they make it easy and they adopt the ICC. But it's always good to check your local codes, right? So the next thing I wanna to talk to in terms of code is that ICC is very specific, right? So code is very specific as what you need to use. So if we're talking in terms of hanging a ledger board, or attaching a top plate to a rafter. There are very specific rules in there about how that's to be applied. And if you look in the code, you will see that structural screws are not always what's mentioned in the actual ICC or in the actual code. 
but they allow for substitutions. How do you substitute something for, for what's in the ICC? Uh, you do that through having a report that proves that you're equivalent or better to what is in the ICC code. So if you wanted to use a structural screw to hang a ledger board and what's in the international code is you have to do this with a lag screw. You have to show that your structural screw is better in a couple ways. It's better in, or as good as, better or as good as in strength uh, for attaching that ledger board and in coding for that exterior coating, right? So you have to prove it two ways for that particular fastener, but it's just a way that ICC allows for substitutes because they don't want to be um, too stringent right? They want to allow for substitutions, but you got to make sure that those products are equal to or better than what's in the code. Um, and just a little bit about that. So as you choose a structural product for your project, you want to make sure that they have code reports on those products, especially in those critical connections, right? So how does a company such as Camo become equivalent or better than what's in code? Well, there's some ways to do that that ICC allows. First of all, you've got to go to an ICC approved certified lab for your testing. So all these products go under the same ASTM test standard. So ASTM is just a way of identifying the exact parameters of a test to be done. And there may be five or six different ASTM tests that they're, that they're concerned with. And all of these structural screws that end up with a code report or a code compliant have to go through this ASTM parameter testing, right? So you go to the certified lab, you do those testing and, and that testing, and they get the physical properties of your screw, how strong it is, how easily it bends, how well that coating performs, all of those things are done at the certified lab, right? And it comes with an output. So after you get through the lab, you have a test result, then you go to a certified uh, engineering group and those tested properties are evaluated. And that evaluation becomes your code report. And so there's a couple of different ones out there that are used. ICC has actually an arm that does uh, testing and evaluation called ES. It's not the same as the ICC group. It's under the same umbrella, but that's ICC ES. And they publish ESR reports or equivalency reports. Um, there's a, a engineering group called DRJ, which is very popular in the structural faster uh, industry. And they, they also do evaluation reports. Those are called TER reports, and that's what uh, camo fasteners does. So our structural screws uh, go through the lab testing. They have those evaluated by DRJ Engineering, and then those code reports are put out uh, for your review or your building inspector's review. So you can tell exactly that we're code compliant. Uh, not only that we're code compliant, but we tell you how to install those fasteners for a specific application. Super important. All right. So what next as we kind of get towards the close here what should you look for in a structural fastener or a manufacturer of a structural fastener right so i think as a builder or a dealer out there you want to promote best practices right remember code gives the minimum required requirements necessary that's not necessarily the best practice right so your best practice is what's the best thing you could do you could put a coated screw in there but maybe best practice for that area is to put a stainless steel screw in that in that structure right so just think in terms of um, are you going to do the minimum required or are you going to do the maximum that you can do and i think companies that promote those best practices like camo does uh, we want to see you build up and beyond the minimum requirements and so the products that we develop should go beyond those minimum requirements um, you want a uh, a provider or a structural screw company that will provide assurance of code compliance right so like we just talked about all these companies, or generally all the companies, will do some measure of code compliant testing or some measure of publication of their equivalency. All right, some do as little as possible and some do a lot. So we test our entire structural line for physical property. So everything in our line has a, has a rating, right? And so it's all code rated material. You can, you can get values on any product in our line. And then we also do very specific testing and evaluation on things like ledger board, insulation, uh, wall systems like top plate to rafter, uh, bottom plate to rim for inside structures uh, where you're talking about wall systems, uh, framing screws to replace nails for those, um, for those load rated walls that you wanna install or if you just wanna use 
a, uh, a framing screw to replace whatever nail application you have. We've got a code rated framing nail, right? Uh, multiply, which are made. So those are sandwiches of material, right? That are made, that they make beams out of. That strength of that beam is very important. So we do specific reporting on the strength of our screws to do multiply beams. Um, and so making sure that you not only have that testing, but that, easy, that it's easy to access for you or for your inspector, right? And so we do a number of things, and just to show you how we do it, I think you'll see some uh, of this on other products as well. We offer technical and install information in, in the form of technical bulletin. So this is just a look at how we do it. So online, you can get on your phone, and you can go to our website and you can find our tech reports on those specific applications, like I just mentioned, ledger, multiply assemblies, truss rafter joists, and top plate connections, those types of things. And this is kind of a way of taking that TER report, which is very lengthy and very detailed, and taking all that really necessary information for installation and enough for your builder or your building inspector to know what he's looking at. And we put that in a simple tech report. And this tells you what you're using, uh, what we recommend, how it should be installed, even down to the spacing needed, depending on the load that you're running for a particular application, right? So we want to give you really easy access to that. I think we've got a shot of our packaging. So should you have our packaging on the job site, we make it easy for you. And many companies will actually, uh, right on there, you can see we've got a bug that says, uh, IRC and IBC code compliant, right? We talk about our coding that's available. But even more important to that, we actually put our TER report numbers, that's our code equivalency report numbers, right on the package here. So it's really easy to find. You can go out to DRJ Engineering, which is listed on here, and look up that report, and you're going to see that exact uh, TER report for your application, right? So if you're buying a ledger screw from us, or another manufacturer, make sure that that information's easily accessible. We also do a QR code on the front of our package. Let's see if I'm pointing to the right package here, but um, yeah, I can't see this one. This one, here's a, good, here's a good look at it. So you can scan that QR code and go right to our website with a link to the TER report. So just trying to make it as easy as possible for you to find the information you need to help your inspector know that you've used the right pro product on the job, right? So. All right, so go back to that other screen real quick here, and we'll take a look at my list and see what else I've missed on the what next screen. Um, so we just talked about offering technical and installation information. You want a company that's going to do that for you. And you want it to be a company also that's going to offer the right products for those specific applications. So do they do just one type of structural screw, or do they do screws for different types of applications? Could be an important thing to look for. And finally, I want to mention that there be, make sure they're warrantied, right? Should be warrantied for the life of the project. You're putting these products in critical connections that people are going to have on their homes or in their homes. You want to make sure it's something a company is going to stand behind. So make sure that they're a warrantied product. All right. And so for me, Judy, I think that wraps up the information that I, that I was going to bring. We can take a look at uh, maybe some of the questions that have come in. Yeah, that'd be great. Yeah, thanks so much for your ideas today. It's been it's been good. Um, I don't know. I think it's good to see what's going on in the industry and where products are trending. So yeah, we do have time for some Q and A. Um, if you've been hanging on to your question and you haven't submitted it to chat, go ahead and do that right now. Um, we do have some questions lined up for you, Greg. So I hope you're ready. Um, okay. Shoot away. The first question I'm going to give you is from a. a Looks like a pro builder. Says that he has a lot of conversations online with, with uh, discussions online with other, you know, builders and such, talking about uh, truss screws and how you could replace a hurricane tie. And then mm -hmm. he's kind of looking for your opinion. So, like builders are seeing the quality in the same or, or better with the new truss screws, but the big concern of the question is, how do you convince inspectors and other builders that this is the way to go? <laughs> okay. Well, so it's kind of subjective. The question is kind of subjective, and I'll give you my opinion, right? So like we talked about, um, a hurricane tie um, has been used for a lot of years. So just like anything that, that, that people have used for a long time, there's a lot of uh, loyalty that, to that product. There's a lot of comfort with a product like that. And then all of a sudden, they're being asked to maybe shift to something that's brand new, right? 
Um, but like I said, um, nothing becomes code compliant without proving that it's equal to or greater than the system that's in the code, right? So as these truss screws, and the advantage for those of you that haven't used or maybe don't do wall systems, that hurricane tie is, is something that's used to tie the top plate to a rafter at every rafter location along uh, the roof line of that house. And a truss screw is one screw that goes up through the top plate, either vertically, um, right into the rafter, or on angle, if you happen to have a stud in the way, it can go on angle through the top plate into the rafter. And that one screw re will replace a hurricane tie that has to have 10 fasteners put into it. And, uh, and so I would just say, um, first of all, it, they, they have to prove their code compliance. So they have to prove that they're not only strong enough for the hold down power, but for the lateral movement loads that are going to go on with those structures. Um, but they also prove themselves in terms of they're going to save you a lot of time and labor on installation. And that's the whole reason for the development of those. We talked about the design of the screw. That's one of the structural screws that really has a different design to it. Um, it's a fully threaded screw with a cylinder head fully threaded because it's not you're not looking for pull down power with that you're looking to have both of those uh, parts of the structure connected fully so the top plates fully engaged with threads the rafters fully engaged with threads and a cylinder head that can be countersunk so that when you put the drywall up it's it finishes nicely over top of that screw but I in my personal opinion I think it's a great way to do it it's a great time savings um, so in terms of my opinion I think the truss screw is the way to go um, rather than the tediousness and expense and labor of uh, hurricane ties. So um, you may run into, and that's one of those things, you may run into a locality that still requires a hurricane ties, and it might be a hurricane area. But uh, uh, for general for general purposes, the truss screw is awesome. Okay, thank we you. We happen to do ours. I'll, I'll, let me mention one other thing. We happen to do sure. ours with an exterior coating on it as well. So we have one screw. It's got our Protec Ultra 4 coating on it because guys are also using that for a beam to joist connection on the deck as well. And so we kept that in mind when we developed that product. So that's another place you can replace one of those ties uh, with a truss screw, so. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm gonna queue up another question for you here. Uh, someone says they're looking for, they're looking at switching from a leg bolt to structural screws. So the question is, how many screws does it take to replace one leg bolt? Mm. I'm not going to I'm not going to remember this off the top of my head. Okay, so there are some situations that will still require. And when you say lag bolt, we're talking about uh, a lag screw that goes through and has a washer and bolt on the other side. So you're really locking two pieces of material together. These are pretty common in say a rail post connection, right? So maybe where you're connecting a rail post to a rim joist or to a rim and uh, and a joist on a deck, where you're using a lag bolt. But just remember, in terms of lag screw, has no has no nut or washer on the end of it. The bolt has a washer and a nut, and so you're you're trapping both sides and sandwiching that together. There are situations where you can replace that with a structural screw, such as to use that same example, a rail post. Um, and I would I would defer to um, technical bulletins uh, if you're in question of how many and how to install and how long those screws need to be. Uh, but if you go to the technical bulletins uh, and they have that connection in there, you can actually block in, rather than just attaching, attaching a post to the rim, you can actually use blocking to add support and then use a screw and not a bolt uh, to lock in that, in that post. And that's just one application that comes to mind in terms of that. Um, but you'd want to look for the specifics of your installation. Where are you installing it? What's the actual application that you're using it for? And then you can lean on the structural screw company to give you uh, what they believe is the best practice in terms of technical information on the length and number of screws for doing that blocking. Yeah. Okay, um, here's another one. This is from Kenneth. He's asking, what product or coating would you recommend for deck blocking in a coastal setting? So like, for example, blocking used for picture framing on a deck. Um, so anytime, so for for just if you're adding just blocking to the deck, uh, you know framing screws work very well. However, the, when you throw in coastal to that, you're going to want to make sure that you're using either a hot gel or a stainless steel screw. When you're near, and it depends on how near you are to the coast, but within say a half mile of the coast, and 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 the concentrate of this 
disperses as further you get away from the breaking water. But what we're concerned with there is not that, not that you're just building something right in the water or on the water, but the air can actually carry salt from the breaking water inland a certain amount of distance and it'll settle on your deck and it'll settle on your fasteners, it'll settle on your air conditioner unit, it'll really corrode those things. So if you're close to breaking water, um, you want to make sure you're using stainless or hot galvanized. So those are things that are accepted in those areas. So for blocking, I would I would simply be using maybe a shorter um, one of our hex head hot galvanized screws if it's something in our line, or if it's you know if there's something available in a stainless steel screw that's code rated, I would recommend uh, using something like that for that blocking as well. So just make sure you're right using the right alloy or the right hot galv coating for that coastal area. Um, no matter what no matter what you're doing on that deck. Because um, you're gonna, you're gonna probably experience some excessive corrosion due to the salt that's carried through the air. Okay. Um, well, it looks like a lot of the other questions kind of overlap. A lot of questions about hurricane ties and replacing that, and mm -hmm. and some salt water questions. That's a pretty so common I think you, one. Yeah. Yeah, that's pretty common today. And then there were just some other questions about. Um, builders and and getting you know inspector inspector you know reviews and things like that but i think between the the information on the head of the screw and the qr code on the on the packaging i think those two things yeah i think just making sure that that information is at your inspector's fingertips the building inspector is going to be the one that checks off on it and so if you're if you're maybe using a new fastener for the first time that he hasn't seen make sure maybe you had a conversation with him beforehand Maybe you leave some documentation to them. I've heard of builders taking a technical document and just stapling it up, uh, you know, on the ledger or you know, on the uh, on the wall system. If it's something that an inspector uh, hasn't seen before, that way he knows what's been used. He can see that it's documented and and equivalent. And so that's a great way to transfer that information to him. We try to make it as easy as possible. A lot of companies uh, do similar things, but make sure you're working with one that does that. Okay, sounds good. Um, that pretty much wraps up our questions. So unless you have anything else to add, I think we're going to get to our coupon codes and giveaways. All right. No, I would just say really appreciate you having me, Judy. Appreciate the time of the builders thank that have, uh, have joined. So thank you very much. Greg, hey, thanks again. I appreciate you sharing all your knowledge. And everyone, I hope you found this topic valuable. And we look forward to seeing you at our next DIY Home Center webinar. Bye, everyone.